frontier of China, was skilled in interpreting events. One day, for no reason, his son's horse ran away to the nomads across the border. Everyone tried to console him, but the father said, What makes you so sure this isn't a blessing? Several months later, the horse returned, accompanied by a splendid nomad stallion. Everyone tried to congratulate the son, but the father said, What makes you so sure this isn't a curse? The house was blessed with a horse that the son loved to ride. One day, while riding the horse, the son fell off and broke his hip. Everyone tried to console him, but the father said, What makes you so sure this isn't a blessing? About a year later, the nomads came across the border in full force, and every able-bodied Chinese frontiersman took up their bow and went into battle. The Chinese frontiersmen lost nine out of every ten men. Only because the son was lame did the father and son survive to take care of each other. And the moral of the story is, truly, disaster turns to blessing, and blessing to disaster. And the changes have no end, nor can the mystery be Folks, we need to understand that God will fulfill His purposes in the grand design of humanity and everything that He purposes here for eternity. God will fulfill that. And that He is in direct control of all circumstances, even through the poor choices of humanity, as well as His direct sovereign influence. Our goal today is to walk out of here clearly understanding and truly believing in the sovereignty of God, that He is sovereign, He is in control. To better understand our message today, if you will turn with me to the book of Genesis, as we continue our study in the book of Genesis, we are now in chapter 38. Chapter 38, and I'll begin reading in verse 1. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Barah. And there Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Er. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shalah. Judah was in Chezib when she bore him. And Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her, and raise up offspring for your brother." But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give the offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brother. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, she was daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah, to his sheep shearers, he and his friend Hirab, the Adulamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance to Enaim which is on the road to Timnah, for she saw that Shelah was grown up, and that she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come into you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me, that you may come into me? And he answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, if you give me a pledge until you send it. And he said, What pledge shall I give you? And she replied, Your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. 
So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. And then she arose and went away, taking off her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adulamite to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked them in the place, Where is the cult prostitute who was at Enaim at the roadside? And they said, No cult prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also, the men of the place said, No cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, Let her keep the things as her own, or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent her this young goat, and you did not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, her daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, By the man who, to whom these things belong, I am pregnant. And she said, Please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. And then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah. And he did not know her again. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put a hand out, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. And she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with a scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, if you're like me, you might be asking yourself, what does this story have to do with the Joseph narrative? It's inserted here right between what currently happened when we looked at last week with Joseph, where we find that Joseph is favored by dad, and he's put in charge of his brothers. This makes his brothers very unhappy, which is only compounded by these two dreams that he's had about how he says he's going to be over them and in charge of them. And so they hate him so much that they conspire to kill him, but they're talked out of killing him by one of the brothers, and another brother comes up with the idea of selling him to slavery. So now Joseph is sold into slavery. He's off to Egypt, and as far as everyone knows, he's never going to be heard from again. Well, next week we know that we pick up with the Joseph narrative, and we find him in Potiphar's house, and we find what's happening there, and we study his character, and we understand more about the character of Joseph as he responds and reacts to circumstances in his life. Well, Hebrew narrative uses a lot of literary devices, and one of them is comparison and contrast. And that's what we're seeing here in the text today, is we're seeing a comparison contrast between moral Joseph and immoral Judah. And we see the decisions and choices of Judah and how they affect what happens to Judah and what happens in his life. Nevertheless, we see the sovereignty of God playing out in the grand design of things. So, the original text here reads, Ba'et ha'heb, and that means at the same time. So, let's think about what's happened here, okay? It says, uh, at the same time, so what we've just read last week is that Joseph is sold into slavery. So, immediately, following their discussion with their father about what happened to Joseph, their big lie, their big scheme, their big deception, Judah takes off. He flees. He wants to get away from the situation. Why? Because he's guilty. It was his idea. It was his idea to sell Joseph into slavery. And so he takes off and goes to a foreign land. He marries a, a foreign wife, completely against the teachings of God. And then we see what happens as the story plays out, what happens to Judah. The fact that the narrative of chapter 38 lies outside of the Joseph narrative tells us that the author put it there for a very important reason. There's, there's no way that this would be in the Bible, in the, in the canon, the identified spoken word of God and the written word of God, if there wasn't some significance to it. And it actually plays an important role in the central theme of Genesis overall. This chapter plays a very important role overall central theme of Genesis. So we read that Judah has these three sons by his wife, 
And the central character here in the narrative, of course, is Judah, and the other character is Tamar. And Tamar is Ur, and then Onan's wife. So why is it that Judah goes to Tamar and he, and he tells Onan, I, I need you to I need you to have a child by Tamar, and it needs to be your brother's wife. Well, if you will, please, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. And we're in uh, chapter 25 of Deuteronomy. Now this is written to the Israelites hundreds and hundreds of years after this event occurred. But in chapter 25, beginning in verse 5, we read this. Deuteronomy 25, verse 5. If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her, and take her as a wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate of the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of the husband's brother to be. And then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists, saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot, spit in his face, and she shall answer and say, So shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house, and the name of his house shall be called in Israel, the house of him who has his sandal pulled off. This is a very major disgrace in public. Okay? This is called the Leverite Law. And we see it being practiced here way back with the original 12. <coughs> Judah is one of the original 12 that becomes the nation of Israel. And so this Levite law is being practiced here, and Onan decides that he's going to violate it, so God takes him out. We don't see in the, in the narrative why Aaron is taken out, why God kills him. But we do see clearly that it doesn't say God allowed him to die. It doesn't say that the circumstances of life because he was evil... He lost his life. It says God killed him. But we do see in the text why Onan is taken out. Onan is very, very despicable. He comes into Er's wife in order to provide the heir for her so that this son of hers will take the name of his brother. And he decides, uh, I'm not doing that. But he enjoys the fruits of, 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 the, of the activity. So God takes him out. What we have here in either case is that the promise of, to Abraham and the promise to Isaac and the promise to Israel is at risk. Overall, what are we looking at here? Judah decides to take off away from the family and marry into the Canaanites. So his wife is a Canaanite. So his offspring are half Canaanite. And then he goes outside of the family again and gets a wife. And so what's going to happen is that there's going to be this watered-down offspring from Israel who is more influenced by the Canaanite culture than by the culture of Israel for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's more of them influencing the family. And number two, Judah's away from the family. How do we relate to that? How do we identify with that? Well, when we have a person who is a believer who decides to strike out on their own, and they, they break away from the fellowship. And they're still a believer. They still confess that Jesus is, is Lord, and that He is the Christ, that He is Messiah, that He is the Son of God, and He is God. And that what He did, sacrificing Himself on the cross, shedding His own blood, perpetuates our salvation, and they believe that in their heart. But when, when they break away from the fellowship, and they sit off on their own, they are at risk of being influenced more by the than they are by the family of God. And there's protection in staying rooted in the family of God. The times, the times where the enemy is pulling us away from the fellowship the most is the times that we need to be in the fellowship the most. Now, being in church doesn't save anyone. You don't have to be in church to be saved. 
But the fellowship of the body of Christ provides protection, you see. And Judah's outside of that in many ways. It's a risk. So what happens here? Tamar deceives. You see that recurring theme? Jacob. Jacob and his family continues to be plagued by deceit. So Tamar deceives, and then the line is continued through Judah. God's purposes are fulfilled despite all of the despicable activity that occurs here. We have despicable activity with Er. We have despicable activity with Onan. We have despicable activity with Tamar. We have despicable activity with Judah. They all do things that are outside of the prescription of God. This is descriptive of what happened. It's not a prescription by God to do things this way. Nevertheless, God's purposes are fulfilled in that Judah brings the line of Israel to Tamar. On top of which, it's reinforced if we miss it, toward the end of the text there, the entire Jacob narrative is summarized up in verses 27 through 30 through the birth of the two sons, Perez and Zerah. Uh, the Jacob narrative begins with a struggle between twins, and it ends that way as well. The older serves the younger. Remember, the, old, the younger sticks his hand out first, and he gets that cord tied to him, meaning, meaning, guess what? He gets the birthright. He gets the blessing. His hand goes back in. The other one comes out. He's the firstborn. The older will serve the younger all over again. God puts his signet ring seal on this text saying, you see, I'm in control. God is sovereign. God brings about his purposes through his direct actions. He brings about his purposes through your and my poor sinful choices. His purposes will be fulfilled. So, through this disguise, this, this birthright is, is stolen again. The older serves the younger. God fulfills his purposes. C.H. Spurgeon wrote this about the sovereignty of God. He says this, There is no attribute more comforting to his children than that of God's sovereignty. Under the most adverse circumstances, in the most severe trials, the people of God believe that sovereignty has ordained their afflictions, that sovereignty overrules them, and that sovereignty is God, will sanctify them all. There is nothing for which the children ought to more earnestly hold fast to than the doctrine of their master over all creation, the kingship of God over all the works of his own hands, the throne of God and his right to sit upon that throne, for it is God upon the throne whom we trust. Praise God that he is in control and that things are just not spiraling out of control. You know, there are some who believe that, yes, God created humanity and that he just set the universe in motion and set it spinning and that whatever happens, well, you know, that just kind of happens. The Bible does not teach that doctrine, my friends. The Bible teaches over and over. And you and I have seen over the past year and a couple of months we've been in Genesis that the sovereign God of the universe orchestrates everything that happens. And what there's no better place to be, right? But smack that in the center of the sovereignty of God. God is in control. Make no mistake. God is sovereign. Amen? You know, as C.H. Spurgeon says, that there, there should be joy in that. And he mentions in, in, in the afflictions that, that they're ordained, the, the afflictions. Why is that? Because you see, no matter how crazy this world gets, no matter how bad things look like they're getting, we can be assured that God has purposed things to happen exactly this way for his reasons, his purposes to bring about his purpose. And so in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our afflictions, in the midst of all of the craziness that this world can bring, my friends, take courage. God has a purpose for it. And it's just, it's just not happening because things are just bad. Amen? Amen. I want to just go through some texts in the Bible. 
to reinforce this idea of sovereignty and to add, if you will, some, add, add some understanding of the facets of God's sovereignty. And so if you'll grab your Bibles, if you're a sword drill, you'll be able to follow me. If, if you aren't, then just, just, just go with it. Over in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 says this. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things, according to the counsel of His will. Some people point at that and talk about being, you know, this double predestination where God predestined some to heaven and predestined some to hell. That's not what this says. What this says is that God has foreordained everything to come about and put you right in the middle of his will. That's what that says. Back to the Old Testament, Psalm 103. Verse 19 says this. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. His kingdom rules over all. Back to the New Testament. Acts, book of Acts, chapter 17. Acts 17, verse 28, says this. And to back up to 27, just to give you some uh, context. The Apostle Paul addresses the people in Areopagus, and it's, he says this to them. That people, he's talking about the people... Uh, of, that, that should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet, he is actually not far from each one of us. For, and here it is, in him we live and move and have our being as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Bow forward to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 11, in verse 36, Romans 11, 36, for from him and through him and to him are all things. Back up. Okay? From him are all things. Through him are all things. To him. about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. My friends, there is a promise that is connected to a command in this text. Command is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And the promise is that.
that you will never be in need. Do you believe that? It's right here in the text. It's a promise in the Word of God that you will never be in need if your first and foremost thought and heart is seeking the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Amen? Amen. Amen. God is in control. He will make provision in, in ways that don't even make sense. I've been in situations, my friends, where the math did not work. It did not work by thousands of dollars. And we never missed a payment. We never missed a meal. In fact, we went out to eat a couple of times. And the math didn't work by thousands of dollars. I don't know how it worked. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And that isn't me. I'm not claiming that. I'm not claiming that. Psalm 104. Psalm 104 says... Bless the Lord of my soul, O oh my God, you are my very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds of the chariot. He rises on the wings of the wind. He makes his message winds. He, he ministers a flaming fire. He sets the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You cover it with deep as a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took flight. The mountains rose. The valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they may not again cover the earth. You make springs gush from the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast in the field while donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches from your lofty abode. You water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. Everything that happens here on earth, the rain, the, the earthquakes, the mountains, everything, the provision to all of the animals, everything happens at the beckoning and control of the sovereign God of the universe. God is in control. Move up to Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God, O King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They will speak of the mighty and awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and His mercy is over all He has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your saints bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. Hear that? The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all those who are falling and raises up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear Him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love Him. But all the wicked He will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless His holy name forever and ever. God up to Jeremiah. Chapter 18. Jeremiah 18. Verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hands, and he reworked it into another vessel. And as it seemed good to the potter to do, 
Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant on it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. Now therefore say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of, the, of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am shaking, uh, shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return everyone from his evil way and amend your ways and your deeds. You see, the sovereignty of God plays into the free will of humanity. You see it? We're involved. We're involved. Look at Proverbs. We'll wrap up with Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16, 4 says this. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Everything has a purpose. Everything. Verse 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. You're involved. Responsible, my friends, as believers, you and I are responsible for the process. But the product belongs to God. Amen? Amen. Look at verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. There is nothing left to chance, my friends. There is nothing. Move up to chapter 21, Proverbs 21, verse 30. Proverbs 21, 30 says this. No wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. We cannot scheme our way out of the will of God. God is sovereign. Let me encourage each one of us to meditate. I don't mean doing the own thing. No, that's not what I mean. I mean to stop and think and take stock of our lives.